and welcome to this week's edition of Farmers Connection. Farmers Connection is a presentation of the Ministry of Agriculture and is brought to you in association with the various agencies of that ministry. Farmers Connection is produced for television by Matrix Video Productions and advertising based in East Barbies. I'm your host, Christopher Holder. On this week's presentation, we will be featuring NARI's Kairuni Operations, the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, NARI. Of course, that particular uh, location is its premier location, and we'll be learning all about that. We will be learning about the uh, potato project, and we've been hearing good things about the potato project. We'll be hearing about that and a whole lot of other interesting stuff coming out of NARI right there at the Kairuni location on the linden Suistike Highway. Rice farmers, do you know that the ideal time of sowing your cultivation is the May, June and the November, December periods? Sowing your paddy at these times of the year facilitates your crop being exposed to high light intensity due to maximum sunlight during the flowering and grain filling stages of the plant's life. This ensures a greater chance of higher grain yield and ultimately a bountiful harvest. Also important to a successful rice crop is the seed rate application. The correct rate is 80 to 110 pounds per acre. The seed may use 110 pound seed per acre. Clean seed, do you know? Seed rate application are but two of a six-step method of achieving a successful rice crop. A message from the extension arm of the Guyana Rice Development Board. The National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute advises farmers to be on the alert for pests in light of the El Nino conditions. There could be increases in pest population in cultivated areas during dry periods. Pests that are not common to farmers may appear. These outbreaks must be reported immediately to extension personnel so that remedial action could be taken. A message from the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, Ministry of Agriculture. Farmers and housewives, it is of vital importance to ensure that everyone in the home wears the proper protective clothing during the application of pesticides. However, it is even more important to be aware that clothing worn during the application of chemicals will be contaminated. You must observe the following precautions. Wash clothing before wearing again. Handle clothing with waterproof gloves. Rinse or soak contaminated clothing first using a hose or a bucket. Always wash work clothes separately from family clothing. Use detergent and hot water. If you are using a washing machine, use the highest water level and the longest wash time. Line dry in the sun when possible. And finally, throw away clothing that won't wash clean. If you can still smell the chemical on your clothing after washing, it is probably not clean enough to risk wearing again. A message from the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board, Ministry of Agriculture. The Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, has introduced the payment of fees by stakeholders of the livestock industry for a range of services previously offered at no charge. This is now possible through the introduction of regulations made under the Animal Health Act of 2011. These regulations now require the payment of fees for the following services offered by the GLDA. Processing and inspection fees for import and export permits and international veterinary health certificates. Fees for the quarantine of animals. Fees for the inspection and export of wildlife. Fees for the import of meat and meat products as well as veterinary drugs. Hatchery services. Veterinary laboratory services. Genetic services inclusive of artificial insemination and embryo transfers. The introduction of fees for its services to stakeholders of Guyana's livestock industry was realized after significant public consultation. A message from the GLDA, Ministry of Agriculture.
The Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, wishes to remind all persons involved in the sale of beef that they must be able to produce an anti-mortem veterinary certificate as well as a post-mortem certificate on the animal that certifies it free from disease or infection before purchasing beef. Consumers are advised to ensure that their butchers and other retailers are able to produce these documents on demand. A butcher's failure to have these important and legally mandated examinations done before and after slaughter could expose consumers to dangerous diseases such as tuberculosis and other foodborne diseases that can result in serious illness and even death. Symptoms of food poisoning include severe cramps, fever, vomiting, and in extreme cases, severe organ failure that could be fatal. Safeguard your family. Ensure that the beef you buy is certified safe for human consumption. A message from the Guyana Livestock Development Authority, Ministry of Agriculture. The National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, NARI, is the premier organization responsible for spearheading agricultural research and extension activities for productivity enhancement and diversification of the non-traditional crop sector, fruits and vegetables, biofuel development, as well as, as plant quarantine services. NARI's vision is to ensure food security, prosperity, and livelihoods of all using technological innovations in agriculture. The Institute is actively engaged in adaptive research that focuses on improving crop production productivity for enhanced food security and rural development. Emphasis is placed in crop diversification from high-volume, low-income to low-volume, high-income crops such as spices and other cash crops, new vegetables like cauliflower, broccoli, red cabbage, and sweet peppers, IPM approach to managing biotic stresses, procurement, and evaluation of exotic germ plasm, like black eye corn and soybean, or field crops, biofuel crops, coconut and cassava revitalization, and technology dissemination through the extension services, the promotion of climate smart agricultural practice, inclusive of protected agricultural systems for year round vegetable productions, hydroponics, and drip irrigation is also given prominence. NARI's Strategic Plan 2013-2020 to envisions the Institute as being the major facilitator for a prosperous, food-secure, and environmentally sustainable Guyana. This will be achieved through enhancing agricultural productivity and the quality of produce through generation and dissemination of newer and efficient technologies and services, reduced import of agri-produce and products, reduced malnutrition and environmental degradation, and enhance exports, taking into consideration the changing global and business environments. With the support of Canada, a research trial on several varieties of Irish potatoes to determine their suitability for local conditions is underway. Thirteen quarter acre Irish potato plots are currently being supported through a 20 million Canada funded Caribbean regional promotion of regional opportunities for produce through enterprise and linkages, Propel project. This undertaking is remarkable since it was Previously thought that Irish potatoes could not be grown commercially in Guyana. The trial began about a year ago when an initial assessment of the suitability of the Guyanese conditions for the cultivation of Irish potatoes was conducted through the Propel project. The trial began about a year ago when an initial assessment of the suitability of the Guyanese conditions for the cultivation of Irish potatoes was conducted through the Propel project. With promising findings, the project also supported several capacity-building initiatives, including cross-regional exchanges for select local producers and research scientists from the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, NARI. On Tuesday, April 19, 2016, High Commissioner of Canada, Mr. Pierre Giraud, visited one of the pilot plots at the Luni, Suistak, Region 4, he highlighted the work of the Propel project as an important part of Canada's contribution to agricultural diversification in Guyana as a vehicle for sustainable economic growth. Through the project, which is being implemented by the World University Science of Canada, is providing seeds and technical support to farmers to help create the most conducive conditions for the cultivation of Irish potatoes. A key component of the sustainability of this initiative is the training and the capacity building of NARI's extension officers, who will in turn be able to provide support to farmers desirous of embarking on Irish potato cultivation.
On Thursday last, I took my camera along on a field trip to Nari's Horticultural Center at Kairouni along the London Suzdak Highway, where we got a first-hand look at the Irish Potato Project and the progress being made so far. We also took a look at the recently acquired mechanical planter and harvester for cassava farmers, and later the orchard on the location. CEO of Nari, Dr. Udo Holmnott, was with us on our field trip to the Kairouni location, and first up, explain the details relative to the potato project. Well, we're standing here in one of the experimental plots that we would have established um, for potato, the Irish potato, in collaboration with the Propel project, which we know has been giving prominence to this, to this activity as we speak. Now, <clears throat> we have always been talking about potatoes um, for a while now, because from the work we have done, at, at Monrepo, for example, we recognize that it's a commodity that we could, we could do, at least at the home level. This has gone a little bit further now. The issues that we were having in terms of the actual seed material was posing problems for us. But that would have been nullified on the, because we were able to get new planting materials um, out of Jamaica. And together with the Jamaican export, working with our local um, um, scientists and extension people, we would have established a number of plots in different parts of the country. Um, right on the highway here, at Kairuni, we have at Dalgin, Laluni, um, two areas in Region 7, and um, in, in Region 2 as well, at Bethany. Now what is, what is going on here is that we have, we, uh, we have six varieties which were brought in. The intent to the first aspect of it is to see which one will perform the best or better. Uh, and then look at the production characteristics. And then determine which, which are the ones, one or two, which we will promote. Of course, this is not a long-term crop. Um, it, it is a 75 days, 90 days, sorry, like any root crop, 90, a 90-day crop. So within three months you will get a harvest and then we will be able to make a determination um, as to the way forward. I, I've seen, um, I should mention, I've seen in the, in the social media and so on, some people referring that this is history in reverse, you know, history in reverse, meaning that potatoes were done in the 70s, you know, in the, but that was done predominantly in the hinterland areas. And the issues, as far as we know and can remember, had to do with transportation in getting that potato out to the coast. And that was the, the, the main bugbear. But the people in region, region 7 and 8, they still purchase potatoes in those regions. So it's, it's being done on a twofold basis. I want to make it clear that the potato that is going to be produced in those regions are not going to come to Georgetown, obviously, because that would not make any sense. What, what their issues were is that they, they didn't have access to planting materials. And through the project, that is how they have been able now to access planting materials. So the project is not only here. Um, I don't recall anything being done on the coast. Times have changed. We have new varieties on stream now um, that are being done in the, in the Caribbean as well. And that is why we have decided to look at those varieties, see how, how they will perform here, before we can make any formal pronouncement. Just if you want some figures, I could tell you that we import close to 3.1 or 3.2 million pounds of potatoes annually in Guyana. Um, based on what we are projecting and the yields that are known for these potato varieties, we will need to cultivate about at least 200 acres annually to meet that demand. It's not going to happen now in the short term, but you need a minimum of 200 acres if we're going to satisfy first of all local demands. And then in, in the dollar figures, um, so it's about 3.1 million pounds that we import. In terms of acreage, about 200 acres would be required. Um, we could do two crops per year once we have irrigation in place. So, and in terms of dollar figures, that amounts in terms of imports, close to 7 million US dollars of potatoes are imported into this country annually. The technical aspects of growing potatoes falls under the purview of research scientist David Fredericks, who explained to us the challenges of growing potatoes in Guyana. 
Well, all the vegetables tell you that potato could be grown on all types of soils, from clay right down to the sands. The key, however, is your site selection. Once you could encounter a location that has a temperature difference of 10 degrees between day and night temperatures, then you want to put in the hole in terms of having potato grown within that location. The other thing is your temperature should not go above 35 degrees. So if you are saying that the day temperature is 35 degrees, evening temperature is 25 degrees, you can have minimum production. But as you come down in temperature, let's say from 25 degrees to 15 degrees, if you have a difference in day night temperature, 25 degrees, 15 degrees, or 26 degrees, 16 degrees, you're getting up in terms of your output in production. So that's your first challenge, climate. Then you have to come to the environmental conditions dealing with things like soil, availability of water, and other input supplies. As I said before, wide range of soils you can grow on, but the demand of potatoes for water is huge. It requires, each plant requires between one and three liters of water per day. And it must be in a soil type that does not hold the water, because potato doesn't like to be wet. So you must have the water but it must be freely draining from the system. So those are some of the challenges you're going to start with. Finding the location and then finding the correct soil type with available moisture. You know we've just come out of a very long dry season. I don't know if it's quite over, but we're having some rains now. As the CEO would have mentioned, we'd have had the challenges having grown potatoes on the coast in the shade houses of getting proper planting material. Through collaboration with Propel, we would have received six varieties that we're going to try in the fields, 13 different locations, each plot minimum of quarter acre. From region 8, region 7, region 4, region 10. We're standing in Kairuni, part of region 4. And we're going to try planting these seeds and seeing which are the ones that are going to give you the best response. Of course, the result is going to be tainted by the fact that we've planted in the wrong season. The best season to plant a potato in Guyana, based on the night temperature differences and weather patterns, is between the November-February period. We've come in in March. So our sponsors have recognized from the start we are on the back foot in terms of the output. So results will have to be cautioned by that negative. I wondered about the potential yield of the trial plots of potatoes. Every field of one acre can take 17,000 plants. And you have a minimum expectation of one pound per plant. So you're talking of 17,000 pounds per acre. That's minimum. You could go up above that. Okay, so in terms of your output, you can have 17,000 pounds per acre. And it's a 90 day crop. So it means you can have a quick turnover. Unfortunately, in terms of planting, you cannot use the same field for a replant. It is advisable you wait at least four cropping seasons, then you go back into the area. So right. that's a potato is a very susceptible crop to pests and diseases. It is probably, of all the crops, attracts more pests and diseases than any other crop known to man. So if you find yourself planting in the same area, year after year, crop after crop, you are going to encounter, first of all, very serious nematode problems. And your production is going to drop from one season drastically to the second season. So you have to do serious rotation and give long periods of planting other crops, the land is not going to waste. Why? To plant potatoes, it's a very heavy feeder, so you require lots of fertilizer. So if in one season you plant potatoes, you can go with other crops in the following season without even applying any fertilizer. It's there. While land preparation for traditional crops are relatively straightforward, it's not so with potatoes. According to Mr. Fredericks, it's very different. Most farmers, when they see a ridge in a furrow, 
the naturally assume you plant on the ridge and you keep the furrow for drainage. Potatoes is the reverse. You have a ridge of 2.6 feet and a furrow is just about one foot. And you have a plant spacing between your plants at one foot. So you plant in the, in the furrow and you use the ridge to mount up the potatoes. Because as the potato begin to grow and produce, what you have happening is that the potatoes begin to form around the circumference of where the plant is. So that's why you have to then use the ridge to, to mound up. You pull it in and you mound up just to keep the potatoes covered. If you do not do that, wherever what is called the stolons, which produce the potatoes, is exposed to light, you could either have another plant coming up or another potato. If you cover, you have a potato. You don't cover, you have another plant. So at the end of it, you just have a flat. You don't have any ridges. At the end of the day, you have a reverse. The ridge becomes the furrow and the furrow becomes the ridge. <laughs> okay? And so it is something that, first of all, farmers have got to get accustomed to, the reverse thinking of bridge and furrow. To back up a little bit, in terms of the life cycle of the plant, again, you said 90 days. You plant your potato seed to a depth of 4 inches, so just about 10 centimeters, and you cover it and you leave it. In that planting, you apply all your phosphorus. Soil tests are important, so you know what you need to apply in terms of phosphorus, in terms of nitrogen, in terms of potassium. So at planting, whatever limestone is recommended, you put all your limestone. Whatever phosphorus is, is recommended, you put all your phosphorus. And for the nitrogen and the potassium, you put 30% of what is recommended. So all of that is placed in the furrow, covered, you put your potato seed and you allow your potato to grow, having covered it with four inches of soil to grow. And that will take you some three to three and a half weeks before that plant emerges. No need to go in trouble, no need to go to find out if it's growing. You leave it, it's going to burst open and come out through the soil and it emerges. Once that emergence is done, it is time to come in with your urea, which is your nitrogen. So you come into 40% of your nitrogen that is required. And you come in with your, your root of potash, which is 30%. So you've applied now, first of all, all your limestone, all your TSP, your phosphorus. So all you need to come in with now is your root of potash and your urea in your second stage. In the third stage, so you allow that to run for another three and a half to four weeks, so you know at what? Seven weeks of the crop. So the seventh week of the crop, you, you had all your nitrogen, you had your nitrogen applied. And so for the final six weeks of the crop, because it's 13 sevens, night one, that is when you come in with all the mute of potash, which is a potassium, and the 30% of urea that is remaining. So when you add it up, you have 100% of everything that has been recommended. Why in that last seven weeks? That is the time when the plant is building up all the food in the tuber. That is where you need the nutrient potash. Okay? And remember again, this plant is being watered from day one right up to harvest. So when that food builds up, with the moisture that you have, for every day you can have proper watering, you can have as much as 1,200 pounds of food supply being stored in those tubers per day. So you need to keep watering. The longer period you water, the more food you're going to build up. You have to evaluate, of course, between the cost of supplying the water and the food supply that you're going to have in terms of that 1,200 pounds per acre and see how you're going to balance off your economics and decide how long to take the crop. But 90 days, 91 days, that's the time to close off. At that point in time, 
you can spray all your plants to kill the foliage, whatever is appropriate, whether it's some dilute sulfuric acid or whatever other um, herbicide that you have, and leave the potato to kind of heal within the soil before you take it out and you have your harvest with proper storage. Cassava is the main root crop grown in Guyana. The tubers are popular domestic food and are the staple food for the hinterland communities in Guyana. Cassava is classified as either bitter or sweet. Cassava is widely adopted for various ecological zones and it is known to be a drought tolerant low input crop. Cassava is used locally for food by boiling. Cassava mounts are processed into flour, farine, cassava bread, cassareep and alcoholic beverages. Cassava can also be utilized as an ingredient in animal feed. In recognizing the importance of cassava both from a food security standpoint and as a crop for value added products, the Ministry of Agriculture has joined forces with the Latin American Consortium for Cassava, Clayuca, as well as other international partners to give impetus to further enhancing the cassava industry in Guyana. It is estimated that there are in excess of 30 varieties of cassava grown in Guyana. Some of these include the four-month Brancha, Butterstick, Uncle Mac, Mex 59, Mex 52, and Bad Woman. The two most common varieties used for cooking are Uncle Mac and Butterstick. Over the years, cassava farmers here have been exposed to training in proper management of cassava cultivation with the aim of maximizing yield through better pest and disease management fertilizer regimes and harvesting techniques. Leading the way in the transfer of technology in this regard has been the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, NARI. Recently, the institute acquired for the use of cassava farmers countrywide two pieces of equipment that will chop planting and harvesting time and cost by more than half. Mr. Pomal Bisham is a research officer at NARI. He explained to us the purposes of the two recently acquired pieces of machinery. Here we have a cassava planter and a fertilizer. Now this equipment was um, brought from Brazil through uh, aid, um, through Cardi actually. Um, now we use this here to do um, cassava planting as well as fertilizing at the time of planting. Now this equipment is um, functioning based on the traction of the tires. Land has to be prepared flat in order for this equipment to work, to, to function properly. Now, um, here we have different gears settings where we have, um, it works based on our um, planting density. If we want to achieve at uh, 10,000 plants per acre, of course, we have to set the gears to suit the amount of plants per acre. Now, if, of course, it can go down or it can increase. It all depends on how we adjust the gear, as well as the fertilization. It depends on the um, amount of fertilizer we want to apply. We set the gear to suit the amount of fertilizer that will the machine will put in the hole before the cassava is planted so we have to set the gears to suit the amount of fertilizer that we want to apply this is relatively new technology to Guyana. definitely um, this is the first um, of its kind in Guyana um, this is pretty um, modern because um, Brazil they're using this a lot in, in Brazil and other um, Latin American countries in terms of capacity what are we talking about for our Okay, it all depends on the amount of planting materials that you have, the quality of planting materials, and depends on the persons who are actually feeding the, the planting material in the slot. Now, this can actually um, give us like more than, than 20 acres of, of um, planting, more than 20 acres per day. Another innovation is the cassava harvester. Here we have another equipment um, funded by um, Cardi. This is the cassava of Ruta, or we call it the harvester. Now this is the only one of its kind here in Guyana. One of the reasons why we are using this machine is because the fact that um, harvesting is, is so labor intensive and it's very, very difficult for farmers to actually harvest cassava because it's something that where you actually has to go down and, and pull your root um, physically. Now with this machine, it's tractor driven. It actually goes below the, um, the, the roots and it will uproot the cassava. You, but what you need to do is to go through after the harvest has passed, go through and you do your selection and you ensure that your cassava is not damaged and stuff like that. But we actually did a demonstration here with this uprooter and it works perfectly. 
especially in sandy area. We harvested uh, um, three acres of cassava in less than an hour, which is fantastic, compared to if we had to use um, labor that would probably take us more than, than 20 um, personnel to do that. According to Bisham, cassava farmers across Guyana can form themselves into groups and access the use of the two pieces of machinery to advance their efforts of planting and harvesting their crops. What they have to do is just come into Nari and we have a discussion first and see how much um, acres they have and the accessibility to the land and probably we could um, work out something whether we're going to loan it to them and, or take it up and do some demonstration and stuff like that. So for now it's free? Oh yes. The Nari researcher later took us for a walk through the cassava cultivation at the Kairuni location where modern innovations were on display. This plot was planted using the, the mechanical planter, where if you could see the land was prepared flat and the mechanical planter was used to plant this cassava. Now, the planting density you use here is one meter square. As I mentioned earlier, we adjusted the planter to suit the planting density of one meter square. Each sticks were cut into about eight to ten inches and they were planted flat along the line. We had no region forest system because the planter has to ensure the wheels touches the ground to, in order to cut the, um, the sticks for planting. Now this plot, is, um, we have irrigation system installed as a drip irrigation system, as you can see, together with a fortigation system. Now, the initial stage when we started our planting, we um, actually incorporate um, NPK fertilizer at a rate of 336 kilograms per hectare. It was already calculated and the planter was calibrated to suit the, our um, planting distance as well as the amount of fertilizer to be applied for each plant. Now here we have an irrigation system where we used the, the drip system as well as the fortigation system. We uh, put our fertilizer in the tanks mixed and then we have a injector that sucks the fertilizer and irrigate at the same time when we irrigate with our water. These plants here are about eight months old and is almost ready for harvesting. We had some um, severe um, problems when it comes to the dry period. That's one of the reasons why we find that our plants are kind of um, small. But all in all this period where we have a bit of rain now, it's ideal now for start or harvesting because um, it reaches the, the, the duration or the nine months period. Okay, here we have a, a cassava just uprooted. We have two, three, four actually potential um, roots here. These roots, um, they could give us a yield of over three pounds per plant, which in is not um, that um, sufficient it's not a, the yield that we're looking forward for. Other areas, we, we got almost seven roots, an average of seven roots per plant, which was considered very good. That's how much pounds? Seven roots are almost about five pounds. According to Mr. Bisham, the economics of planting cassava is very favorable. Harvested from actually three plants of cassava planted using the mechanical planter. Here we have actually over 15 pounds of cassava, really, if you can look at it. We have over 25 roots here. So it, it's equivalent to like about five pounds of cassava per plant. Now that gives us in over eight tons of cassava per, per acre. So which is considered very good because our national um, production average is about eight tons and this gives us more than eight tons per acre. So it clearly shows that the, the potential for cassava is Im Im immense. We have some other um, improved varieties as well that in, we are doing some trials at the moment and trials and multiplication of the varieties. As soon as we have that available, we start to release it slowly to farmers. Okay, based on these returns, actually, um, we could get over um, half a million dollar profit taking out our expenses from planting one acre of cassava. The National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute advises farmers to be on the alert for pests in light of the El Nino conditions. There could be increases in pest population in cultivated areas during dry periods.
pests that are not common to farmers may appear. These outbreaks must be reported immediately to extension personnel so that remedial action could be taken. A message from the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, Ministry of Agriculture. The Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, wishes to remind all persons involved in the sale of beef that they must be able to produce an anti-mortem veterinary certificate as well as a post-mortem certificate on the animal that certifies it free from disease or infection before purchasing beef. Consumers are advised to ensure that their butchers and other retailers are able to produce these documents on demand. A butcher's failure to have these important and legally mandated examinations done before and after slaughter could expose consumers to dangerous diseases such as tuberculosis and other foodborne diseases that can result in serious illness and even death. Symptoms of food poisoning include severe cramps, fever, vomiting, and in extreme cases, severe organ failure that could be fatal. Safeguard your family. Ensure that the beef you buy is certified safe for human consumption. A message from the Guyana Livestock Development Authority, Ministry of Agriculture. Farmers and housewives, it is of vital importance to ensure that everyone in the home wears the proper protective clothing during the application of pesticides. However, it is even more important to be aware that clothing worn during the application of chemicals will be contaminated. You must observe the following precautions. Wash clothing before wearing again. Handle clothing with waterproof gloves. Rinse or soak contaminated clothing first using a hose or a bucket. Always wash work clothes separately from family clothing. Use detergent and hot water. If you are using a washing machine, use the highest water level and the longest wash time. Line dry in the sun when possible. And finally, throw away clothing that won't wash clean. If you can still smell the chemical on your clothing after washing, it is probably not clean enough to risk wearing again. A message from the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board, Ministry of Agriculture. The Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, has introduced the payment of fees by stakeholders of the livestock industry for a range of services previously offered at no charge. This is now possible through the introduction of regulations made under the Animal Health Act of 2011. These regulations now require the payment of fees for the following services offered by the GLDA. Processing and inspection fees for import and export permits and international veterinary health certificates. Fees for the quarantine of animals. Fees for the inspection and export of wildlife. Fees for the import of meat and meat products as well as veterinary drugs. Hatchery services. Veterinary laboratory services. Genetic services inclusive of artificial insemination and embryo transfers. The introduction of fees for its services to stakeholders of Guyana's livestock industry was realized after significant public consultation. A message from the GLDA, Ministry of Agriculture. Householders, the fumigant aluminum phosphide, commonly known as carbon tablets, is a highly restricted use pesticide that should only be handled by trained professionals in the pest control business. This fumigant is among the deadliest in the world and should only be applied in sealed or enclosed places. It must never be used in the home office or where humans live, work, or play. It is not a rat bait and should never be used as such. A message from the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board, Ministry of Agriculture. The Kairuni Horticulture Center along the Linden Suzdak Highway is one of Nari's showpieces. It features a range of citrus and other fruit orchards on approximately 60 acres of land. We're, we're at Kairuni, as you know, and um, Kairuni is one of our, not one, our largest single holding um, in the country. Now we have here about 60 acres that has been planted. This here, as you see here, is, is the avocado. What we have here is all the different types. And this, this location is what we call a drum plasm bank. Where we have all the different fruits in, that are grown in Guyana, as well as all the varieties of the different fruits, for, like avocado, cherries, and you name it. This is where we get all our 
from this station, we get most of our seed material from, as well as material to do budding and grafting. We'll see the citrus that is used as well for budding and grafting that other people would use too from time to time. So that is the main focus here. It's a very huge operation. And it also serves for people who want to invest in this type of eco-zone, the kind of crops that they can, you, you can cultivate and so forth. So we will use this sometimes as a model for investors who want to, especially those who are investing in this on the, on the linen sewage like highway. And that's the purpose of this station. During our walkabout, we were shown an amazing array of fruit trees, including some exotics we had never seen before, like the one borne by this fruit that looks like a cactus. We are also shown the acacia tree, which harvests nitrogen from the atmosphere and transfers it to the soil. Yes, yeah, so this is the acacia, acacia mangium, a very good legume. And because it's a legume, it naturally captures nitrogen from the atmosphere, stores it in the plant. So you can actually use these leaves as very good mulch within all your food crops to supply a natural source of nitrogen and avoid all the heavy use of fertilizer in your cropping systems. You were shown the various seedling nurseries and the shade houses in which sweet peppers were being grown. Yeah, this is the other um, type of activity we're promoting or we promote on the, in these areas. Um, shaded cultivation. Um, it's better to use the shade mesh in these locations because of the heat that the plastic sometimes generate. Or you have to use both plastic and um, and mesh. And of course, here is showing that you could do sweet peppers very, very successfully. Um, if you look at the trees, they are already in production. And if you were to feel the weight of this at this point in time. This eventually, two of those probably will wear a pound at the end of the day. Okay, they are very small at, for, for at this stage, anyway. So this is some of the things that people want to do, like the land that they have, whether it's sandy or not, you would still do vegetables on the shade. Harvesting of rainwater is a simple exercise with this setup, and as Dr. Holmnott explained, it's very cost effective. This particular setup provides water for the two shade houses. Watering is done manually. This is Farmers Connection, a presentation of the Ministry of Agriculture and brought to you in association with the various agencies of that ministry. Early in uh, to this week's program, we brought you a feature on cassava, uh, the mechanization of uh, cassava planting and harvesting. I thought I'd bring you this uh, feature and download it uh, off of the internet, uh, a look at uh, cassava production in Nigeria. Uh, this is uh, showcasing the efforts of uh, well, particularly women in Nigeria in the cultivation of cassava and of course going the extra mile for value added. As you know, a value added is the direction uh, that Guyana is now going in terms of its agricultural production, looking at agriculture holistically as a business a vehicle through which wealth can be generated. For joining us today on the program, I'm Ayola Kasim. Many say cassava is a crop that grows everywhere here in Nigeria. Despite that saying, the yields are well below attainable yields. The question is, what are the farmers doing wrong? Today on Earth Fowl, we will start from the farm of Mama Sifawo in Ibadan. Just stay with us. For 28 years, Mama Sifawo Safiu has been farming in Alabata, a settlement in Akinyele local government area of Oyo State, Southwest Nigeria. She grows cassava, vegetables, and maize. <laughs> Seven months after planting, this is what she gets as her harvest. She makes up to 20,000 naira during the high season when the rain is not too much nor too little, an income that barely sustains her and her family. Apart from dealing with the changes in the weather pattern, 
her planting techniques, as well as the variety of cassava she is planting, are preventing the expected success on her farm. She belongs to a small all-female farmers group. They are suffering from illiteracy, weak financial base, and poor access to resources and services. Aziz Drojaye, a cassava grower and who was once an extension worker within the Akinyele local government area, advises the farmers on better agri practices. His frustrations is that many farmers here need more help than he could provide. For instance, the female farmers still use local varieties that has been known for its low productivity level. Meanwhile, there are about 46 improved cassava varieties in Nigeria. In sub-Saharan Africa, cassava is mainly a subsistence crop grown for food by small-scale farmers who sell the surplus. It grows well in poor soils with limited labor requirements. It provides food security during conflicts when the invader cannot easily destroy or remove the crop since it conveniently grows on the ground. Cassava is usually intercropped with vegetables, plantation crops such as coconut, oil palm and coffee, yam, sweet potato, melon, maize, rice, granite or other legumes. The application of the fertilizer remains limited among small-scale farmers due to the high cost and lack of availability. Cassava is very versatile and its derivatives and starch are applicable in many types of products such as foods, confectionery, sweeteners, glues, plywood, textiles, paper, biodegradable products, monosodium glutamate and drugs. Cassava chips and pellets are used in animal feed and aqua production. Scientists at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture have played a leading role in developing improved cassava varieties which are disease and pest resistant, low in cyanide content, drought resistant, early maturing and high yielding. Disease resistant varieties give sustainable yields of about 50% more than local varieties. The IITA varieties can also produce better yields. Nigeria is doing very well by creating market, domestic market. Alfred Dixon is the project leader, sustainable weed management technologies for cassava systems and head of partnership coordination office at the IITA. His peers call him Dr. Cassava, a nickname he inherited more than two decades ago. Being a cassava breeder himself, he understands the challenges the farmers and indeed the sector is facing in Nigeria. We used to have the linear approach towards research, extension, and farmer linkage. You researcher develop your technology, you end there, just pass it on to the extension, extension pass it on to the farmer. And we've been doing it for the past 50 years. And where has it got us in terms of agricultural development? In my view, nowhere, because the farmers are even getting poorer and aged. The average age now of farmers in Africa I think is about 57. And with that type of system where the farmers do not have new knowledge or new ways to do things, they keep on sticking to their old ways of doing things in a very subsistent way, we will never get our youths into agriculture. Efforts to transform Nigeria's agriculture have raised the production of cassava to more than 50 million metric tons per year. With several factories now processing cassava to products such as flour, dairy, glucose and ethanol. But looking at the use that farmers like Mama Safiau are getting, there are strong indications that there is a much higher potential in the country.
farmers and householders. Pesticides and other chemicals used on your farms, gardens and in your homes are dangerous and can result in death or serious injury if mishandled. It is important to ensure that all pesticides and toxic chemicals be secured in a locked cabinet away from children. Never store pesticides in the same space as food, animal feed or other supplies. A message from the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board. The Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, has introduced the payment of fees by stakeholders of the livestock industry for a range of services previously offered at no charge. This is now possible through the introduction of regulations made under the Animal Health Act of 2011. These regulations now require the payment of fees for the following services offered by the GLDA. Processing and inspection fees for import and export permits and international veterinary health certificates. Fees for the quarantine of animals. Fees for the inspection and export of wildlife. Fees for the import of meat and meat products as well as veterinary drugs. Hatchery services. Veterinary laboratory services. Genetic services inclusive of artificial insemination and embryo transfers. The introduction of fees for its services to stakeholders of Guyana's livestock industry was realized after significant public consultation. A message from the GLDA, Ministry of Agriculture. The National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, NARI, is advising farmers to use water for irrigation purposes with care. Water is essential for good crop production, especially vegetables, which will easily and die when water is in short supply. Here are some useful tips for preventing wastage of water while irrigating lands. Apply water directly to the roots of plants, preferably in the late afternoon. Water roots deeply every other day, rather than quickly splashing water on plants daily. Build up the organic matter content of the soil to help retain moisture for longer periods of time. And farmers could install more efficient irrigation systems such as drip irrigation and micro sprinklers. A message from the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, Ministry of Agriculture. Rice farmers, do you know that the ideal time of sowing your cultivation is the May, June and the November, December periods? Sowing your paddy at these times of the year facilitates your crop being exposed to high light intensity due to maximum sunlight during the flowering and grain filling stages of the plant's life. This ensures a greater chance of higher grain yield and ultimately a bountiful harvest. Also important to a successful rice crop is the seed rate application. The correct rate is 80 to 110 pounds per acre. The seed may use 110 pound seed per acre. Clean seed, do you know? Seed rate application are but two of a six-step method of achieving a successful rice crop. A message from the extension arm of the Guyana Rice Development Board. The National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute recommends that farmers cultivate crops under shade during this dry period. Cultivating under shade reduces heat stress to plants. Less evaporation takes place under shaded conditions, therefore reducing the need to frequently irrigate. Materials that could be used as shade include shade mesh and branches. A message from the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, Ministry of Agriculture. Farmers and Housewives It is of vital importance to ensure that everyone in the home wears the proper protective clothing during the application of pesticides. However, it is even more important to be aware that clothing worn during the application of chemicals will be contaminated. You must observe the following precautions. Wash clothing before wearing again. Handle clothing with waterproof gloves. Rinse or soak contaminated clothing first using a hose or a bucket. Always wash work clothes separately from family clothing. Use detergent and hot water. If you are using a washing machine, use the highest water level and the longest wash time. Line dry in the sun when possible. And finally, throw away clothing that won't wash clean. If you can still smell the chemical on your clothing after washing, it is probably not clean enough to risk wearing again. A message from the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board, Ministry of Agriculture.
that's all the time we have on this week's edition of Farmers Connection, a presentation of the Ministry of Agriculture and brought to you in association with the various agencies of that ministry. Farmers Connection is produced for television by Matrix Video Productions and Advertising. I'm your host, Christopher Holder, urging you to join me again next week as we bring you yet another edition of this weekly program. In the meantime, be good to yourselves and to each other. Yeah.